Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Nicholas Cullinan, director of the National Portrait Gallery and also the curator of the Freeze Masters Talks program. And I'm really thrilled tonight to introduce our two speakers, and I'll say more about each of them in a second. Every year, of course, we think about you know the, the ideal combination of talks, and I have to say, I don't think we could have a better combination of artist and interlocutor tonight. So um, Zoe and Tyler will be speaking for about 45 minutes. And then at the end, they're very happy to take any questions from the audience. There'll be a roving mic. I'm happy to kind of compare the questions. So um, while they're talking, please do think about anything you want to ask them. And just to say, I think we have a hard stop at 7.30 because I'm sure we all have lots of other things to go to. But thank you all for being here. And of course, I also want to thank the Arts Club for hosting us. And the fantastic team at Freeze Masters, I see Nathan Clements Gillespie, the director of Freeze Masters. <coughs> and it's always so wonderful to work with you and the team, and especially this year for the 10th anniversary. So congratulations. I think a round of applause is in order. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna do the formal kind of reading of the biographies. So, first up, Zoe Whitley. Zoe's been director of Chisholm Hill Gallery since 2020. And as a curator, um, she's worked at many institutions. I can't believe how many. So the Victorian Albert Museum, Tate Britain, Tate Modern. And then she was the senior curator at the Hayward Gallery. And of course, she's organized many major exhibitions, site-specific commissions, and related publications, as well as a very popular program of public talks and events. At Tate Modern, of course, we all know her fantastic exhibition, which she co-curated with Mark Godfrey in 2017, Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power which was rightly described by Art News as, quote, one of the most important exhibitions of the 2010s. I would say even beyond that. Soon after, she was selected to curate the British Pavilion at the 2019 Venice Biennale, featuring work by Cathy Wilkes. And Zoe's research interests also include expanding children's access to arts, which I think is commendable. And as a result, she's authored children's books, including Meet the Artist Frank Bowling, Meet the Artist Sophie Tober Arp, and working with Shauna Jackson on the award-winning Tenton Hudson book, Black Artists Shaping the World. She serves on the London Mayor's Commission uh, on Diversity in the Public Realm, and is also a trustee of the Teager Foundation. So, Tyler Mitchell, over to you. Um, I mean, first of all, before I begin the biography, of course, the reason that Tyler's here is twofold. There's a fantastic exhibition at Gagosian Davy Street, which I've just seen, and I have to say the photographs I find incredibly moving and beautiful, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that this evening. And of course, Tyler was also invited to uh, make a special commission for Freeze Masters, really sort of mediating on the idea of the contemporary and the historic, which is, you know, Freeze Masters raison d'etre. So we're really thrilled to have Tyler here. So Tyler is, of course, an artist, photographer, and filmmaker based in Brooklyn. He received his BFA in film and television from NYU Tisch School of the Arts, and his work introduces new narratives about black beauty and desire embracing themes of the past and creating fictionalized moments of the imagined future. Tyler's work is characterized by a visual, visual representation of black life that emphasizes empowerment, play, and self-determination. He is often inspired by pastoral and domestic scenes from his upbringing in suburban Georgia. In 2018, he made history as the first black photographer to shoot a cover of American Vogue for Beyonce's appearance in the September issue. The following year, a portrait from this series was acquired by the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Sadly, not the National Portrait Gallery in London, but I think we're going to work on that. I feel very competitive when I hear this, <laughs> for its permanent collection. Mitchell has been a visiting artist and lecturer at a number of institutions, including Yale University, Harvard University, NYU, Parry Photo, and the International Center of Photography. So without any further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tyler and Zoe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick, and thank all of you for being here because, um, as Nick rightly said, I know that you could be anywhere else, and so to choose to be here, um, we really appreciate it. And Tyler, we're so proud to have you in the city. Um, Londoners have been a topic of a number of your works before, but to have this new body of work, I think, helps many people understand you in uh, a really multifaceted way. So what we aim to, aim to do tonight is really just to have um, as informal a conversation as possible, but we don't want to assume knowledge about um, Tyler's back catalog. So we're gonna get straight into it. We'll be um, assisted by some images that we've put together. And really, first things first, let's start with the first. So um, first always have these double edges because 
they often belie, you know, who hadn't had the opportunities before, what that might mean. But this was a very special moment for, for all of us, for you to be uh, the first black photographer to shoot the cover of American Vogue magazine in its 125 year history. So um, I would, I'd like to know what that meant for you. I mean, first I'll also thank Nick and Nathan and Freeze Masters and Zoe, because Zoe specifically, um, we've been friends in passing and have becoming closer recently. And Zoe is the first person to put a um, Red Carava physically in front of my eyeballs. So I want to thank her for that in her Soul of a Nation show, which was mind blowing. And um, how I feel about coming to this commission and being asked to, to do such a, uh, to photograph such a wonderful woman, person, and um, do such a huge commission, I suppose, historic commission, it really felt right. I mean, when I received the call, it was kind of startlingly, it felt startlingly right in my spirit to be asked to do this sort of a thing because um, beyond the sort of history moment, I was so interested in simultaneously music, politics, fashion, history. I mean, basically my entire teenage years and upbringing in Georgia was centered around loving images, loving movies, loving a mixture of things. And so I think in particular Vogue, when they called me, knew that my work s sat at this intersection of being very interested in how uh, images can be used to expand ideas of black identity um, and that Beyonce would be an amazing subject for that sort of work. So I felt very uh, honored, but also it felt very right when I got the call about this. And to that point, that kind of rightness, or you're speaking about this kind of, this moment and this building up, um, I do think it's useful for us to look at some of those firsts and those precursors because the, the length of time that passed, even in terms of thinking about the history of, of fashion photography, that, you know, U.S. Vogue didn't have its first black cover model until 1974. This is Beverly Johnson, for those of you who don't know. Um, and the first cover ever to feature um, a black woman was Danya Luna's cover on the March 1966 British Vogue um, issue. I still wish I had this one because it's the most astonishing thing. But even the tropes that you see, even the way that her face is obscured, that it's a stunning image, but we still, so much is meant to lie in this kind of ambiguity and like not being able to read someone as necessarily black. And I think that we, we've come a long way even in the, the 10 years that preceded your cover with Franca Sozzani's um, Black Issue for Italian Vogue where there were four different covers. So we had Leah Kibede, um, Cecily Lopez, that's Jordan Dunn, who's a British model. Um, Naomi Campbell, of course, who needs no introduction. But the fact that there are these like long pauses between, um, I think that, to me, warrants a question to you. Where were you finding your source imagery um, in, your, in your youth or in your formative stages before that call? Yeah, I mean, there kind of became a shift when I wanted to start thinking about making images about black life, about my own experience, right, about all of these intersections of interest, really was meeting Deborah Willis, who some people in this room may know as a curator, a historian, a teacher. MacArthur Fellow. MacArthur Fellow, artist, um, and head of the photography department at NYU. So I was a film student at NYU, and as I started getting interested in photography, was sneaking a lot down onto the photo floor. <laughs> And Deb Willis essentially said, why don't you, you know, take a class if you keep coming down here? <laughs> and um, the name of her class was called Black Body in the Lens. So it was quite, I'd never seen a university course centered around this idea of the history of black images. I mean, my, my, my mind was basically expanded, you know, tenfold, hundredfold in terms of the idea that there was a long lineage of, of image makers who had been denied such opportunities, right? But also were making work about uh, expanding narratives around how we image ourselves. Uh, and so I wanted to contribute to this canon and this conversation. And uh, I think the exciting thing for me about this amazing canon of images, specifically Vogue images and what where my image is situated is that in a way it's sort of has this like, um, there's an unguardedness to how we're seeing Beyonce in that image, and I really like that as opposed to how we're sort of conditioned to see just women in fashion images. So I, I, th I found that a really exciting opportunity to do that sort of thing, and yeah. 
But there's a real writing of history there and in bringing Deb Willis into this conversation and into the room and how foundational she's been for all of us, I think that that's a crucial aspect as well. If we think of um, Viewfinders, one of the first publications written about black women photographers, that it was the photographers themselves writing that history or individuals like Dr. David Driscoll who are artists in their own right, but then also having to create the space for the history and I think the idea of, of space making is something that I think comes through so clearly in your work. And actually, the first time that we'd met properly um, was in, in a type of black utopia at one of the Astergate's black artist retreats. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we were sitting next to each other with we American were sitting artists. Next to each other. We were yeah. at a meal. Yeah. And so I feel like, for the benefit of the whole room, can you tell us a little bit more about your notion of, of black utopia? Yeah, well, I think it's sort of this thing to be played with, and it's not fixed at all. And this idea of utopia, you know, in general, is kind of this, by definition, this place, this unreachable place of perfection, right? So I'm playing with this idea of visualizing. I suppose a lot of people in my pictures, there's sort of the signature now of them existing in nature in this sort of Edenic, idyllic scenario and all of the political, social, aesthetic implications that go on in 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 that um and so this show which um nick so well introduced is down the street um everyone at, must see <coughs> it at, at gagosian davy street um plays with that even further in a way that i'm really happy with and um yeah i think space making is important but i think it's also like the transgression or the idea of uh, making images of black people in nature, what that means as it sits against the backdrop of all the images I, l I learned about from Deborah Willis, whether that be uh, images by Gordon Parks or images by uh, the lesser known Baldwin Lee or early Hudnall Jr. I mean, these are all essentially black photographers who were making work in the somewhere in the American South and the rest of the world and had a lot to say about um, how black folks should should look in nature where there's sort of this breakthrough of sort of freedom in that existence and sort of like personal and spiritual freedom, I suppose. And uh, I think this work concerns itself with all of that. There's a yeah. lot here about um, permission and agency and giving yourself permission to enjoy yourself. And it makes me think a lot about um, an artist and an activist named Trisha Hersey, who also refers to herself as the nap minister, um, who talks yeah. about like rest as a radical form of what it means to exist. So um, one of the things that I thought would be nice to do, in addition to everyone seeing the show, was for us to look at the images and kind of talk to them and with them. And we start here because, as you were saying about what perhaps has become a signature, um, some people understanding your work of um, black figures in landscape, enjoying nature and being part of it. Um, there's a different mood in these works and there's a shift that comes and this is the titular work of the exhibition, Chrysalis. So can you talk us through this one? Yeah, I was interested, like I was having a lot of studio visits and conversations and I think I'd made like my first book two years ago, which had this sort of like very joyful title, I Can Make You Feel Good. And that's and published by Aperture. Published by Presto. Oh. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Although I love Aperture. Oh, um, God, that completely wrong. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Shout out to Aperture. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's on its Switch edition now. It's on its second. Okay. Second, which second printing, and it's a really a book I'm very proud of. But it's, um, I think after making that, and that kind of was out my system, I was having a lot of conversations about the ideas that were on the edges of the pictures, so to speak, metaphorically, like this idea that within the bounds of a lot of those pictures, it was un unabashed joy, right? There were a lot of images of um, yeah, friends, uh, artists, uh, sometimes celebrities, sometimes not, people embracing one another, gummy embracing bears. themselves, gummy bears. So right? much hand-holding. A lot There's of hands. just hand. a really wonderful sense of connection. Yeah, I started to think of like a show of like all limbs because I realized I'm obsessed with hands, I think. but or And there's also like footsteps in the show. I started to realize that sitting at the metaphorical edges of those pictures was this idea of what was socially denied, right? And what was not his psychologically always available there. 
um, for black folks, if that makes sense. It does. Um, and this idea of hypervigilance, right, and uh, ability to exist freely or not exist freely in public space, specifically in America. And these works lean into that tone more. You know, I think they still are about this idea of repose and a sort of meditative state, but chrysalis in and of itself being this idea of cocooning, right, away from the world, um, and, and sort of transforming and evolving is what the show is really about, so, yeah. Here's another image from the show, because there are, there are ways in which the recurring themes really come to greet you in this space, and I think particularly around this aqueous notion of water and this kind of coexistence of soil and sky and water, and I think this is one of the images that is so visually lush, even in its kind of very singular palette. Mm. And if people are thinking, you know, if they think of some of your high saturation moments, even with the two editions of the book, the fact that every detail you've thought of, so even even the page marker ribbon yeah. changes color, yeah. you know, that I know you're thinking so much about that, but to work in this, certainly I wouldn't say desaturated way, but to move differently and to think about the natural world differently. Mm. How did you come to find this location? A lot of image research, as it usually starts, sort of thinking through just like images become like food for me or something. It's like looking at them starts to feed how I could think about making new ones. And I found a lot of images of actually specifically a, a ritual, essentially a voodoo ritual um, in Haiti. And I thought that's interesting. There was sort of a part where a hog is slaughtered and there's all these things. I, actually, Dina Lawson has made some photographs of these rituals, but part of it that I hadn't seen as much was people swimming through mud. I mean, that in and of itself is, is, is an interesting context in which I moved it into my work, but Haiti's also a part of the global south, right? I'm from the American south, from Georgia, and so there's that loose connection, but also water in and of itself, mud, right, sky, these elements, but specifically water and mud, I think called to my mind a, a lot of connotations as it relates to the black experience having to do with spirituality, right, um, passage through water, um, whether that be historical across the Atlantic or even the Windrush generation, so to speak. Water as being this thing that black people have always needed to move through and contend with, um, throughout well, time. it forms a barrier. It forms a barrier. Sometimes it's welcoming, sometimes it's calming, sometimes it's uh, menacing, right? So there's this, all these ideas, these connotations that I wanted to just loosely leave for the viewer to arrive at. And this, and also the idea of like, just the undulating forms of the water, yeah. you know, rather than like, uh, as, as opposed to the sort of the more colorful thing. Calida Rolls, Phoebe Boswell. There are a number of artists working right now in that space of thinking about what it means, even the, the politics of being able to swim, of having having that knowledge and being able to move through these kind of different thresholds. Um, these works in particular feel so meaningful because you've created these uh, diptychs effectively where the artworks are speaking to one another and you mentioned so we see the the muddy footprints there so they're these ways in which we're leading to something and then we're back into this world that is um, more highly constructed and for me it would be really insightful to know how you distinguish or maybe you don't between the painted backdrop of uh, of musicals, of Hollywood films, of, of photographic studio work, and finding these natural landscapes that then may also, you know, this one to me, I, I'd mentioned Cartier Bresson to you, that there are these ways in which you are constantly straddling these different things. And the one, the one uh, signifier that you didn't use, Nick, because there are many identities that you embrace, um, is skateboarder. Mm -hmm. And I think that that notion of, of how you came up as, belonging to a subculture and being part of a community and what it meant to kind of image that community and see itself feels like, to me, potentially a key to unlocking the ways in which now you're constantly navigating what it means to simultaneously be uh, a photographer who can balance commercial projects with artistic projects. But I wanted to know more about how you felt in, in thinking through this type of way of negotiating in particular what we might think of as the the natural or the given and the artificial because in some ways we may think of that also as the difference between the studio space and and a commercial space but somehow the the lines always seem much blurrier in your work yeah yeah there's a there's a lot there I guess I think 
in starting to think about how to make work for a show, which is more recently what I've been thinking about, um, you know, my fashion work, which is where I've come from, right? And starting, I started making images for myself, but also being asked to, right, by magazines and brands. And so I started to think that those were essentially staged images, right? Real or fake. They were things that I set up, right? Whether there was sort of a model in front of the camera or a musician, that the scenarios in which they were in were essentially staged. And how that, for me, started to become almost more true than the truth itself, right? Like that the moment that I ended up getting as a photographer um, and challenging or asking the viewer to question these ideas of what's real or what's imagined became really exciting for me. So what Zoe's talking about on the picture on the left is this sort of pre-made uh, canvas painted backdrop that, you know, you could get from a vernacular, is from a quotidian like a uh, set shop basically mm -hmm. where you know mall photographers and like um, studio photographers would essentially hang a backdrop behind like a very aspirational type of backdrop and families you could imagine would come to the mall and get their portraits made so I liked playing with that as a sort of enveloping environment for this young girl that we're seeing on the left and then the real environment right the real natural environment and world also enveloping this young boy on the right and so I think this work pushes all the way to the edge of asking the viewer the question of what's real and what's imagined in, in more ways than one, right? Emotionally, psychologically, historically, socially, all of that. Um, and here we have another series of works. So this is, now we can see the scale in relation to a work that we may well have seen with this um, tire swing and then the beetle on the nose of this young boy. Um, can you say more about this location? Yeah, these were, um, this was Cold Spring, New York. So upstate New York, um, it became a location. I mean, living in New York, I, I live in Brooklyn, and upstate becomes a place I often go to. Um, it's a great place to make images, but it's also specifically this lake in Cold Spring started to look like Georgia for me. And so I wanted to, and think about doing, how am I going to do a show in London, and where am I going to make the images, and this idea of place. I think I wanted to sort of de-place all the images. And I think like, the, the facts of the where the works are made is I'm, I have no problem revealing that, but it's it for me is more important about this like geographic mind space that's in the work. Like I'm thinking about the South. I'm I'm thinking about the fact that these are at least going to start in living in London, and that I want to continue to bring the South with me wherever these works go. If that makes sense. So I found a place in Cold Spring that to me reminded me of lakes or parks and places I'd been to in Georgia because. Atlanta's landlocked, you know, and so most of the experiences near water were lakes. So that's where the, these images are made. And um, yeah, I think also part of it's like also trying to unburden the photographs from being, you know, so focused on biography, if that makes, which we kind of talked about. Like, yeah. I would, I, I love the idea of pushing photography to its edge in terms of asking the viewer to let go of needing to know all that information. There's a mood here. I yeah. think so much of this is about the mood that's created when you're standing in front of them and that you're able to, if not feel the coolness of the water, there is this sense of, um, of the sky and the air kind of wrapping around you. Yeah. Um, this is the aviator. So with this, again, this, this palette, you're bringing in all of these kind of like very rich, deep kind of soil colors. You know, there's like Georgia clay as a very particular color, yeah. and it seems that you're bringing in a lot of that in with these greens and in with skin tone. Were you, were you thinking about palette in yeah. relation to how mood was created? Definitely, yeah, and everything's very intentional from the burgundies to the greens to the, the browns, and... Um, the Aviator, and this time, you know, I was reading a lot of, I'm, I'm very late to the party, but Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. I think I kind of, like, was forced by a teacher I didn't love to read Beloved in high school and kind of was like, I'm going to yeah. <laughs> give give that time and space, and then came back around to it, like, basically three years ago. Okay. And reading Song of Solomon was thinking a lot about this idea of flight, metaphorical flight, and mm -hmm. kind of the aviator <laughs> and all these ideas. Not that he's flying at all, but this idea that, um, there's sort of psychological thing going on, maybe underneath. Well, lo like notions of retreat or how you might escape. Yeah. So um, here's another one. This one is iridescent. 
And what I loved about this is, again, moving away from a kind of high saturation color palette or what we might think of as a very artificial notion of iridescence, that you've gone right back to the kind of luminosity and reflections on the surface of the water or even the mud on this person's skin to then bring in what does become this kind of opalescent quality. Mm. And it's like you can, you can really feel it. Mm. Um, <coughs> I don't know what else to say about that. I just, I really enjoy looking at it. Um, here's one of the artworks you can see here. And again, in this instance, you've taken that same notion of the picket fence painted backdrop, but then use this as a constructed backdrop. Yeah, exactly, and like they they all become these parts of like an imaginative state, you know, like the like I really enjoyed the idea of like making photographs that reference other photographs you've made, and like this cycle, and um, also just things I hadn't seen before. I hadn't never seen like this <laughs> this sort of <laughs> picket fence arrangement like this in a picture before, so it felt nice to make. And how often? How do you play with when how you riff on? your references, because again, some of your early references having been people like Larry Clark, so people who take photographs of particular youth subcultures, but then transition into making like independent films and things that you can then have access in this different way, but you, you take it and you make it your own in a particular manner. Yeah, I mean, it's important, the research for me, it's a very like, it's a very like foundational process. Um, I think that, you know, essentially like this idea for me of, of growing up with Tumblr as the main access to like art or artistic or creative images when I was younger, it still feels foundational. I know Tumblr is a ghost town now, but um, this idea that like you would receive a swarm of images, which is kind of how we're receiving images now in the world in the age of Instagram, which are largely decontextualized, right? Which are largely um, just about how you immediately instinctively respond to them. A lot of those for me were just of exactly what you said, Larry Clark, uh, Ryan McGinley, and more recently, Roy DeCarava, um, Gordon Parks. But all of these inspirations, Larry and Ryan specifically, I'll talk about because they are two photographers who are essentially making images of of youth and nihilism, right? These ideas of un, un, unburdened youth outdoors, right? I remember a book that Larry Clark made in, with J.W. Anderson, with Jonathan Anderson, who I now work with, which is kind of amazing, but um, a book, a booklet that I came across in Dashwood uh, of these kids in Paris running around essentially with cameras. And I like the idea of like photographs of other kids photographing each other, photographs of um, kids uh, creating something, right? Like producing something and also existing in the world in an unburdened way. So I thought to bring those ideas into this universe but and sort of how can I blend together some of that with some of the things I wanted to talk about about um, about black existence, right? So um, that was, and, and that also, you know, that also goes into a, a certain quote Carrie James Marshall gave about his vignette paintings. Mm. It's another reference, but Carrie talked a lot about Rococo painting, right? And finding these old styles of painting that were kind of discarded, seen as frivolous, right? Rococo's like, oh, it has nothing to say. But I like that he brought that into his work and tried to fuse it with a lot of the socio-political stuff that he was going through and talking about because he felt that maybe if he took sort of this cynical approach to like love and vignettes and black folks existing in parks that there it finally cut through what he was trying to say. And so here we have um, image of your installation at Freeze Masters. Mm -hmm. So um, interestingly here, and to your point of, of thinking about the possibilities of photography, mm -hmm. one of the things that you've done, and we'll come to an image that I feel like makes a, a good precursor to these, is that you don't just print on paper, but you've also done these works, showing work as if they were on a laundry line, um, printed on textiles. How did you first come to that as a, as a way of... A display. Yeah, of, of a display, but equally of, again, of creating mood and a yeah. feeling. I think of, of changing the experience that we would have as viewers when we're encountering your work in a space. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, um, Isolde Brielle Meyer, who works at the New Museum now, who also was a professor at NYU, who I met, um, asked if I would do a show at the International Center of Photography in 2020. 
um, opened January of 2020 and closed due to COVID. Um, but when we were doing that show, part of the space that they had was like a 20 foot long hallway where it's kind of like, what are you going to do with this hallway that nobody can, you can't walk through there and like look at photographs. You sort of have to, you have to do something. You have a 60 foot long hallway and you can't really put photographs, it's too narrow. And I started to think of this idea of hanging, I was always interested in hanging photographs or showing them in a way that wasn't so one-to-one, -one, that wasn't just about coming at it as a serious framed object, although I love that, also about more subjective play with how images can be seen. So the hallway became a perfect basically impulse to try and print on fabric. I mean, I basically thought, is it possible at all to do it well? I mean, of mm -hmm. course, fashion, there's this idea of UV printing and all of this, but you were never sure if you can render it the same as you can on paper, right? So we found a process that I really like, which is dye sublimating onto fabric and um, basically made an installation down a 60-foot hallway that I found really successful, not only in terms of the mood or the tone, but also in terms of putting upside down this idea of creating subjectivity in photography viewing. But that being said, I continue that here and... Uh, I really enjoy it because it brings this idea of form and content together. Like in the the work where the two boys are lifting the sky backdrop over this sort of horizon, like it adds to this sort of painterly idea, right? And this conversation, especially within the context of Freeze Masters of uh, old painting, contemporary photography, and that dialogue. So, yeah. It also creates motion when there would otherwise be stillness. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us something about the, the first camera that you used? Because I'm fascinated by the technology like, built in that camera where you were able to pivot between making still images or making moving images. Yeah, yeah. The, there's this camera I had in, um, I think, 2009. or I remember like skateboarding a lot. And my friend had a Canon DSLR, essentially, that had a flipper between video mode and a photo mode. And I, um, I, I thought at that time I was going to be a filmmaker, something like a, like a Hollywood film. I don't know. I just had all these ideas about, I'm going to go to film school, and I want to make movies. And, and I still, very much, that's part of my practice. But um, I'm at getting ahead of my questions now. Am I? OK. <laughs> all right. I'm just rambling through. No, it's good. But at that time, there was a mode between where essentially I could make a video and at the same moment flip right over and make a picture. And so for me, these two things have always been almost simultaneous and related. And um, I've never separated them, essentially. I've never really been able to separate in my mind a moving image or a still one. So this idea of creating motion in an exhibition feels fun to me. Mm. And this, to me, was such an important precursor. <laughs> yeah, um, and exactly. It's one of my favorites. Um, can you tell us more about this one? I don't know. It just came to me that like I grew up in this organization that maybe people here won't know as much, but in America it's sort of a thing called um, it's kind of funny called Jack and Jill, yeah. and we talked about it, and kind of this funny like stuffy kind of upper middle class like has this weird reputation <laughs> black social uh, group, I guess I'd want to say, and um, I love it. I love growing up in it honestly because it 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 gave me a context and like a socialization around just other black kids from around the Atlanta metro area. So it was basically hanging out, doing like social work or philanthropic work with other black kids from around the Atlanta metro area. But part of the logo was, there was a logo of Jack and Joe was that is actually of these like kids holding hands in a silhouetted, it kind of looks like something from a Jordan Peele movie. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit creepy, <laughs> uh, but beautiful. And... Anyway, I've never even admitted this, but I feel like this is something to do with that. Like, there's these kids, core uh, like, together. Yeah, like, core memory. There's these kids together, right? And it's beautiful. They're behind this laundry line doing something, holding one another, whispering, creating a shape. And there's this moment between, and it feels like the yard, right? Maybe they're running out. So there, I, I think this is part of, like, the narrative-making element of my pictures where there's this implied moment before and after and this idea of the laundry line being fundamental to black life in the South and all of that is in there. And then this is a still from idyllic space. I mean, we've been talking about the notion of idyllic space, even if we've been calling it other things, but um, with this still from this film, that was really one of the, one of the notions. So here now we've, we're going back in time a little bit. So we've gone from a kind of very opaque body of water, this swimming through mud to something that, you know, almost crystal clear. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the water, I guess, has been there. This idyllic space film was actually something um, I remember I had an idea for when I was asked to do a show of Foam Photography Museum in Amsterdam. And uh, I asked if Antoine Sargent, who uh, now works at Gagosian Gallery and has been a friend for like five years, if he would come to Atlanta and like write about <laughs> uh, me making this film which he, he did, and he came down and he saw me making this film. This is a film, basically, that's meant to be screened on a ceiling, um, and it was screened on a ceiling in that show. But everything was sort of meant to be seen from below and playing with this idea of perspective between viewer and subject, as it were. Um, and, yeah, I've always been thinking about this idea of water as a central space for to talk about, or an essential element to talk about black identity, but also like making this film was about particularly perspective, looking up this idea of history around like what it means to look up at a viewer, at a, at a subject, so yeah. How do you find your subjects? A big question. Everywhere. Um, I don't know, I was at a Rosalia concert a couple of days ago and I found like some twins there that did their own hair, and I thought that was great. I want to photograph them. I, you know, I mean, I kind of like am running into people. The person here, um, and all of it is background information. It's not like they're yeah. in the photograph, but um, this person here named Salim is somebody who ba who uh, is lives in Atlanta. I made this film in Atlanta, and was always asking me if he would would want to. He's a he said he's a photographer. Would love to work with me or would love to assist me. So a lot of people are usually photographers or artists or other people of that yeah. sort. So you've got a beautiful, beautiful portrait of Kimberly Drew. Kimberly Drew. Yeah. But and Toyin Oji Odutola. I like to photograph other artists. Um, and here now we're bringing um, a series from 2018, um, and these were. Is this part of your welcome stove? No, this is no. this is this is um from a magazine story, random magazine story I did for Document Journal, but it's an image that has always stayed. Um, it's just of two. I guess I like kind of lookalikes as well, but I liked this idea of the embrace with the pink hand, and I liked the. I think this was when I was making work that was a lot more overtly colorful, and I like this idea of texture through fashion and Nature's embrace so and present. repose yeah the landscape is so present that this i think illustrates so well that slippage between um, your artistic endeavors and the commercial ones because if you had said this was something that you had done as a project of your own making rather than you know something that you've done on assignment it certainly has that that same look and feel we go to this one. Nice. So people may recognize this from the, the cover of your book. Um, and this is Boys of Walthamstow. So um, this was made here, obviously, or n maybe not so obviously, but the Walthamstow marshes, which I kind of just went out to and took um, essentially five, five, five friends or friends of friends. I had known a couple people here. I was really interested in making a new, I some sort of new image. I think. The work at this point in time was oscillating between e either commissioned work, which was the previous image we saw, and how I could relate it stylistically to personal work. Um, this image I essentially made in the Walthamstow Marshes because I'd heard that the Walthamstow Marshes were a place that looked a bit like Georgia. Right. It's kind of like <laughs> asking around. And it, in fact, it does to me at least, the willow trees in the back, and this idea of a sort of line of young men, right, which calls forth a lot of ideas about uh, whether it be sort of uh, Angola, right, chain gangs and this sort of history, but also so to get... this is Angola prison in Ang Louisiana, for those of you who may not know. Right, and a famous image that came out of that of, of black men, like, working the tilled land. So that history, but also just pure friendship, togetherness, and and for me, the, the necklace, which I really I like. that's what felt so striking and startling in the best way about this image is to the first question that we, where we started the conversation, that sense of how rarely we're able to see images in a kind of public space of intimacy between black men as friends, black boys. And so there's this, this comfort that they have in one another, that they can stand that close together, um, that they can just be in this space is something that's always, it's an image that stays with me so much as, so signature to what your work stands for. 
it's really, it's beautiful. I just want to thank you both. I mean, I think that was a really phenomenal and insightful talk. So please join me in thanking thank you, Tyler and Zoe. Thank you. <laughs>